This is the 13th part of a series of videos, many videos, about parametric curves and the associated parametric equations. Our main goal in all this is to develop some calculus tools to understand these curves and understand the main application we're thinking about, which is to motion. All right. I am approaching uh, the development of these calculus tools from a very intuitive, physical kind of way, in fact, like a physics teacher would probably do. Even though I'm a math professor, I'm not going to do it the mathematical way in these videos, which would focus on rigorous math involving limits. Okay? I will talk about limits intuitively, but we're not going to approach it real rigorously. I want to approach it, again, intuitively, physically, geometrically. And the main thing I want to emphasize in this video is that when you graph the distance traveled function and the speed function of a particular kind of motion in the same uh, situation, that the outputs of the speed function give you the slopes of the distance traveled function. Okay, Maybe that's a clear concept to you right away. Maybe it's not so clear. Um, especially if it's not so clear, you're going to want to work real hard at listening very carefully to what I say. Once again, here is our main situation. Pause the video if you want to read through that. I'm going to go down to the bottom and look at our functions. Three functions again. First of all, the situation for constant speed along a straight line. Uh, you've got these linear functions that will do that. Then we have the situation where we allow for a certain kind of change of variables, you might call it, to create new kinds of motion along the same line. And this kind of calculation that I did and explained shows that it's along the same line. And in the last video, we looked at this new task for an arbitrary h of t that is increasing in value from 0 to 1. I made that extra stipulation over the interval from 0 to 1. We wanted to find the distance traveled function, dist of t, and the speed function, speed of t. All right, we, we used a right triangle, a changing right triangle to help us do that using the Pythagorean theorem. I should warn you then that this kind of analysis is only going to work when the motion is along a straight line. We need other kinds of calculus tools to think about what's going to happen when the motion is not along a straight line. This was the formula for dist of t that we found in the last video based on this arbitrary h of t. And we can illustrate um, what's going on with the distance traveled and speed with this code. Okay, So this in this code, um, h of t equals t squared. So this is motion that starts out slow and speeds up. Just like we derived here with the Pythagorean theorem, the distance traveled function is 5 times h of t. All right. And then I did something a little strange, if you haven't had calculus before. I used this prime, this prime operator, you might call it, to define the speed function as what's called the derivative of the distance traveled function, dist prime of t is the speed of t. Okay, Again, we're approaching this from an intuitive standpoint. We are assuming, you're, you're, you are believing me when I say that this operation is going to give you the speed when you know the distance traveled as a function of time. These graphs can illustrate that if you are careful to think about them carefully. The blue graph is the distance traveled function and the red graph is the speed function and I'm going to show you that you can also label this graph to show that uh, distance traveled is going to be in blue and speed is in red. For a little bit of extra clarity and fun, let's make this bigger. And also, let's make these words their color. So I'm going to make the blue be colored blue and the red be colored red. Now we've labeled the graph in that way. Could label the axes as well. The horizontal axis would be time. The vertical axis <clears throat> is both distance and speed. You should realize that these are, this is numerical, a numerical matching. <clears throat> of course, the units would be different. Distance traveled would be in meters and speed would be in meters per second. I'm claiming that the red graph is giving you the slope of the blue graph. The speed is the slope. The speed is the slope of the distance traveled function. It certainly looks relatively intuitive. The distance uh, traveled function starts out with a slope very close to zero. In fact, at time zero, it does equal zero. And then it gets steeper and steeper. It's concave up. Therefore, its slope is increasing, and the red graph is increasing. Okay, that's 
some evidence. It's not sufficient evidence to really believe it. Here's something that would give you a little bit more evidence. If, for example, we wanted to estimate the slope, the speed, at point 8, I hope you realize that this kind of calculation would give you an estimate for that slope. Think about this. What is this? This is called a difference quotient. A little bit of time goes by from time equals 0.8 to time equals 0.81. So this is the change in the distance, change in position, so to speak, which is the distance traveled when you're going in one direction. And this divided by that number is the time elapsed. This is change in distance divided by time elapsed. That's the average speed over the time interval from 0.8 to 0.81. What is it? 8.05. That ends up be, being close to the slope of this blue curve at that time as well. Look at where the red curve is at time 0.8. It's very close in output to 8. In fact, it does equal 8. Speed of 0.8 equals 8. These are very close in value. They're not exactly the same, but this one gets closer and closer to the other one, the smaller and smaller the interval gets. We keep getting closer and closer to 8. That's an intuitive idea of a limit, a numerical evidence that the limit of this quantity as the time uh, interval gets shorter and shorter is this quantity. I'm not going to rigorously prove that. That's not my goal. My goal is to see uh, that it does seem to match. Let's do another example. Let's change the 0.8 to a 0.6. All right, so what's the slope at 0.6 of the blue curve? It would be this ratio approximately. That should be close to the value, the output of the red curve at 0.6, which is about 6, in fact, exactly 6. Speed of 0.6 is exactly 6. This should be close to 6. Yes, 6.0005. Okay, this is some numerical evidence. Let's do another example. Instead of a t squared, let's make it square root of t. What kind of motion is this? This kind of motion starts out fast and slows down. This blue graph, the distance traveled graph, is concave down. That indicates that you're starting off fast and slowing down. The red curve is giving you the slope of the blue curve. If I do these two calculations once again with this new example, we should get a close match. 3.22735, 3.22749. This is a more exact approximation of the speed at time equals 0.6, a more exact approximation to the slope of the blue curve and the value of the red curve. This is an approximation to it based on this difference quotient idea. Again, this kind of motion is going fast at first and slows down. Actually, a technical technicality here is if this were an exact modeling of the motion, technically the speed at time equals zero is actually infinity. This is going off to infinity. Now that couldn't actually happen in real life. You know, you can't go faster than the speed of light for one thing. Um, though maybe it could be relatively closely modeled in this way. One last example for this video. Um, don't worry about where I got this. I was experimenting a little bit before I made this video. I'm going to let my h of t equal 4 times t minus 1 half to the third power plus 1 half. What's going on with this motion? You're still going from 0 to 5 in, in one second of time. Blue, The blue curve is still starting at 0 and going up to 5. You're still traveling 5 meters overall. But now you're, you're going relatively fast to begin with, then you slow down, then you speed up again. Just like the red curve starts up high. Go, goes down and then goes up again. In fact, evidently at time equals 0.5, your instantaneous speed at that moment in time is zero. Um, don't worry about what that means at, at the moment. We'll talk about it more later. Let's just verify that these are close in numerical values again. Yes, they are. This is the exact slope of the blue curve at time equals 0.6. The slope there is 0.6. How about that? Coincidence. And this difference quotient is close to 0.6. Let's try 0.8. The approximate speed at time is 0.8 is about 5.4. And this confirms it. Yes, exactly 5.4, in fact. All right, we'll continue to talk about this concept as we go through lots of these videos. We'll bring it up again and again.